Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. If you are a Disney fan, today you will be in heaven. Besides our own regular Disney certified co-host, Ike Eisenman, we are thrilled to welcome another legend, the producer of some of the most beloved Disney classics of all time, such as Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, executive producer of Disney Nature Films, owner of the production company Stone Circle Pictures, and author of many Disney books, such as Dancing Corn Dogs in the Night and The Alchemy of Animation. We're thrilled to have be our guest, Don Hahn. Don, thanks so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Well, to, to start with, looking at your resume, it's tough to know where to even begin. So many Disney classics and iconic films that have become family favorites. So let's start by asking, what were some of your favorite movies when you were a kid? Oh, when I was a kid, you know, I kind of grew up on 101 Dalmatians and Jungle Book and, um, and those films. We didn't, I didn't actually go to the movies all that much. We had a, a drive-in near us, and that was our big, oh. our big treat because my dad could fit everybody in the back of the station wagon and um, you know, we would, we would go to the drive-in and, and kind of back into a parking space, put the little speaker in the window um, and, uh, and, you know, with our pajamas on, open the tailgate of the uh, mm -hmm. station wagon and uh, sit there and watch Jungle Book. You know, it was a really memorable time. I love driving <laughs> stuff. I always loved that. I never got to go too much as a kid though. So <laughs> yeah talk about retro it is uh, a vanishing species but it was um yeah it was really fun really good times but when did you start first start thinking that you might want to pursue animation and things as a career well i never i never really thought that much about animation in particular i just loved disney i never necessarily wanted to work even in hollywood or film or anything i just wanted to work at disney which is a very different kind of thing you know i i a lot of friends and colleagues work or wanted to work in um, animation specifically. And I was a music major in college. I was a, um, a drummer and a percussionist and I played the cello and different things. And, um, and so I was really um, into music as much as anything. And I really loved everything about Disney that I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, um, a, a town called Bellflower and I was close to Disneyland. So we would go down there and and pay the ridiculously expensive fee of $6.50 to go inside the park, plus yep. 50 cents to park, um, <laughs> yep. and yep. <laughs> uh, go have a great day at Disneyland. And, uh, you know, so I, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the Imagineering, um, you know, specials on the Disney Sunday uh, mm -hmm. show. And um, so, you know, it was just by chance I got a job when I was 20 years old at Disney and uh, never looked back. Why, how did that happen? I mean, yeah, you're that involved. I had a, you know, we had a friend at church, actually, who, who worked in the morgue, the, uh, which was the place they stored the old animation at Disney. And um, they needed summer help. And so I left school, uh, left college and um, went there to work that oh, summer. Wow. But I never really went back to college. Um, and I don't regret it because it was, you know, it became my university. Disney Studios became my university because I could study and learn from these artists that were there and they were great you know i i would I, you know I was just delivering things so i would deliver uh, some animation or some drawings or a coffee or something but i would deliver it to ken anderson or to frank thomas or ollie johnston or willie wow. reitherman and uh and all those guys were still at the studio and so um there was a culture of learning and passing on the animation knowledge that i really got uh seduced into and thought it was great just curious, what were some of the films that Disney was putting out when you when you started? Uh, they were just finishing Rescuers, the first Rescuers, and then Pete's Dragon, which I worked on with. I, I went, um, Don Bluth needed an assistant, so I went up and worked with Don Bluth for a while, who was the animation director on Pete's Dragon. And that was one of the first movies I worked on. And, um, and you know, then from there, Fox and the Hound and Great Mouse Detective and some of those shows. But I think P Rescuers and Pete's Dragon were kind of the era I started back in 76. Well, and so your first responsibilities were like just, you know, taking things around. I'm just curious. 
Yeah, they really were, you know, and I, uh, Don Bluth had a movie going in his garage, you know, he, he, he was always uh, interested in learning more about the animation process. And there was a general feeling from Don that the studio wasn't necessarily going aggressively into animation. Um, mm -hmm. So on the weekends, he would uh, have people over and they were making a, a kind of a garage movie called Banjo the Woodpile Cat. And uh, <laughs> you can probably see that out there in the world somewhere. Um, and but it was a place where I could go and learn how to in between. And um, I was always an artist. I was a painter and an art minor in school. And I learned how to shoot camera and learned how to do a lot of things just on that weekend movie. And then um, eventually the same thing happened at Disney. I uh, was lucky enough to work there mainly in, in production. You know, I wasn't so much an artist. I saw early on that I wasn't going to be Glenn Keane or Milk Call or somebody like that. Um, there were a lot of people who, you know, I just didn't have the patience really to sit at a drawing board all day long. And, um, and so it, producing and, and be working in production was a better fit for me. And, um, and, and so that's kind of the direction I went and worked on, you know, Mickey's Christmas Carol and all those movies wow. just as a production person. Gosh, I mean, and, and, and so you, you come to Disney, you've already mentioned Don Bluth, and you're immediately working with these legends like Wolfgang Reitherman. Can you tell us a little bit more about working with them and what that was like for you at the time? Yeah, well, Wooly was interesting because he was the one that Walt Disney gave the responsibility of running animation. You know, he, Walt was so um, busy and bogged down with uh, everything else he was doing, which is mainly Disneyland and television. Um, that he had very little time for animation. And so Wooly, he saw as a leader, Wooly was a great animator. He animated a lot of wonderful, um, oh, scenes of Goofy and Monstro and, you know, just amazing stuff going back to the earliest days of Disney features. Great artist and, and kind of a great leader. Wooly came from the military. He was a fighter pilot in World War II mm -hmm. um, in the Pacific uh, and was a pilot all his life and uh, a real leader and kind of a John Wayne guy, you know, wore, um, wore Hawaiian shirts and uh, smoked cigars and, uh, you know, real kind of big hearted, but a good leader and a good consensus builder because the talent at that time were, you know, kind of, I'll say the nine old men, but it was nine old men plus, you know, there was a lot of mm -hmm. women, a lot of people like Ken Anderson and, and, uh, and other talents at the studio that were beyond that nine who were big egos and big talents and somebody had to wrangle all that and walt was the ultimate wrangler back in the 30s and 40s um, but in this era it was really woolly and he was able to do that uh, and i was lucky enough to sit in the room you know we would record an uh, something on fox and the hound with mickey rooney or whatever and and then go back up to woolly's office and i could sit there and play the you know, my responsibility was to play the the takes back and we would all listen to the takes and and it would be you know, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston and, and, and Don Griffith, one of the layout guys and Wooly and, um, and I was just the gopher, you know, I was just the PA that would sit there and, and play the tapes. And this was, we didn't have cassette tapes, we had a, a record album because when you recorded on the soundstage, the uh, recording stage made a live vinyl record album for you. And we would take that record album up to Wooly's office then, and you could drop the needle anywhere you wanted to and listen to whatever track you wanted to listen to. And those albums still exist. They're in the archives mm. and they're really interesting. Mm. It's the raw, you know, it's everything on this vinyl album. Uh, and, and that's just a technology that was probably there on the soundstage since the 40s and never went away. So a little bit of it was time travel. It was going back into a studio that hadn't really changed that much. I mean, I started 10 years after Walt had died. And, um, and there was a sense that he had just passed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, people talked about him um, fondly and um, for the most part, you know, he was a, a taskmaster and a, uh, you know, someone who demanded excellence from his people, um, but they loved him in general, you know, and I've, I've worked with a, a lot of people, the Shermans and Joe Grant and a lot of people that worked directly with Walt Disney. And I always, and I've, I knew Diane, his daughter and, I always tried to get some sense of, well, was this guy just a rotten, terrible, you know, guy? Um, and he wasn't. He was certainly demanding. He certainly had his bad days. Um, 
and was grouchy, but overall it was all about the work. And he came in in the morning and it was, it was completely about getting the best quality he could. And he was a brilliant person in terms of casting his people. He would hire uh, these really interesting people and then cast them in different ways that were maybe unconventional. Um, and he would come in one morning and say, okay, we're doing uh, an attraction for the World's Fair that has uh, thousands of dolls singing a song <laughs> about uh, UNICEF. And uh, so Sherman Brothers, we need a song uh, by next week. And, uh, and if you guys can design some dolls and stuff, that'd be great. And so, and everybody was fearless. It was a very fearless culture when it came to doing whatever needed to be done to entertain the planet. And that was a, a spirit that I really, to this day, love. I'm just still a child. <laughs> you're, you're coming into Disney. You're talking about the Sherman Brothers, the Nine Old Men. <laughs> I mean, what a start to a career <laughs> to come on in with uh, all yeah. those people. I, I was lucky. I was really lucky. I, I'm jumping around a bit. I mean, it, you're, you're, you're career is just like you know so many classics i want to try to get in when i can um one of your first credits in the production side is one of my favorite films uh, who framed roger rabbit can you tell us a little bit about that film and working with zemeckis and while filming it did you think that it was going to be this iconic uh classic that it became uh well i i, I had just finished um I, I either i think i guess great mouse detective and uh and there was an opportunity to start working on um, Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit had been around the studio for a while and Zemeckis wanted it, but it, it, until the management changed over and Eisner and Frank Wells and Katzenberg came into the studio, there wasn't a real opportunity to outreach to the outside industry. So the minute that happened in 1984, then people got a chance to um, approach Disney and say, hey, there's a property that you have called Roger Rabbit that I really want to work on. And Spielberg and Zemeckis did that. They came in and, and um, approached Disney and immediately got that property. I had just worked on um, uh, Pete's Dragon, as we said before. And mm -hmm. so I knew a little bit about live action and animation combination. And uh, so I was a candidate to go over and start working with them. And that was amazing. You know, I, I was then working over on the Universal lot in um, uh, uh, Amblin, which is Steven Spielberg's compound, which is this delightful kind of southwestern, um, oh, it feels like you're in Taos, New Mexico, except you're in Burbank. Um, and being there to work with those guys was another cultural education because, again, they were all about the movie, but in a very relaxed, very um, collegial way. And um, Zemeckis was a great writer, obviously, with Back to the Future and, and a lot of his films. And uh, so being able to be in the room, and I was producing the animation on that movie. And so uh, he wanted to bring in Richard Williams, which, who was a brilliant animator, um, British, Canadian British animator. Um, and, and we also hired Chuck Jones at the time. And Chuck came in and, and helped with some character designs. So to sit there in, in, at a table with um, Chuck and, and Richard and, you know, the storyboard or watch them storyboard was, again, I, I feel like I was just a uh, Forrest Gump kind of character to be able to see all these things. <laughs> mm. um, but I worked my butt off and, uh, you know, tried to show up early and leave late and do everything that had to be done to earn the right to be in those rooms. And um, somehow that worked out. So that was a great, great opportunity. And I, I ended up not necessarily knowing I would work on it, but I, uh, they liked me and I liked them. And so um, everybody agreed that I would just go work on the movie when well, the movie was being made in London. And, um, and, and, you know, so I'm this 30 year old guy who'd been at Disney for a while, but um, it was a great opportunity to have a breath of fresh air, work in London. And we started from scratch. We got a building up in um, Camden town, up in the North of London an old factory building and hired people out of the, off the streets to come and animate. And some of the great, great animators of our generation now, like James Baxter and Nick Ranieri and Tom Cito, um, Andreas Deja, they all came from that movie. So um, it was a, a really good time. Did I know it was gonna be a classic? No, uh, we, had, <laughs> we had times when we looked at it and uh, did like a screenings of it and thought, oh man, this is a, a this is a stretch and we actually had one preview screening in los angeles 
when it was unfinished, it was just pencil tests and a lot of unfinished material where there was a lot of walkouts from the preview audience, which is kind of a disaster. Oh, um, but afterwards, everybody stood around and said, you know, we're, we're not going to tell anybody this happened. Uh, we're going to finish the movie and we're going to make whatever changes and edits we need to make. And a lot of it was the audience wasn't um, used to looking at unfinished animation. Okay. That yeah. was a process that had to happen over the next 10 years or so and happened mostly with Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and Mermaid. Um, so a lot of it was just people were saying, this is weird. This is like some weird Invisible Man movie with Bob Hoskins talking to nobody in a chair and like, what's going on? So a lot of it was just that misunderstanding on the audience's part. And we just, you know, we just said, okay, well, let's put our heads down and finish the movie. Uh, and, and it was a phenomenon. It was really amazing the way that people reacted to that movie. Well, I'm I'm one of them. It's a huge I'm a, it's a huge favorite of mine as well. And and I, I remember watching in the big big climactic scene with all of those animated characters in the same in the same scene in the same frame at the same time was just like blew my mind. Um, I mean, you already had Disney support, but what uh, were there any? Uh, what was the kind of agreement you? Was it difficult to get the agreement from Warner's and Fleischer Studios to 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 use the characters? And were there any restrictions or? or promises that needed to be made over their over their usage. I, yes, I think that because Steven Spielberg was involved, that opened a lot of doors because he had good relationships with all the studios. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to use, uh, you know, Warner Brothers characters um, freely. There were a few restrictions, um, particularly with star characters like Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse. We had to um, agree that Mickey and Bugs would be on the screen for the same amount of time, that one wouldn't be favored over another. Uh, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, But some of the secondary characters like Foghorn, Leghorn, and Yosemite Sam and that we could use pretty freely. Um, and you have to remember they animation wasn't a big deal back then. Um, they hadn't been using these characters in a long time. So it was like it's like saying you want Betty Boop, fine, you know, like she's somewhere <laughs> she's in the closet back here somewhere. I don't know. And um, but it was it was delightful because <clears throat> it turns out Betty Boop and um, uh, Coco the Clown and some of those characters were owned by uh, the Fleshers, and Richard Flesher was still around, and he he was a director that directed Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, uh, and he was. Um, you know, the son of the original like Max Flesher era guys. And he would come by the studio and talk. So we'd have, they'd have to do approvals. They'd have to see the work we were doing, but they were so happy to see their, their characters being used. Mm. Wow. Now I was re reading up on uh, the Roger Rabbit as well. And now, is it true that all these famous celebrities turned down the role of Eddie Valiant? <laughs> that... Well, I don't know how many did. Um, uh, I, I, yes, I mean, that always happens on, on films that people either aren't able to do it or don't, don't want to do it for whatever reason. Um, and I think Bob Hoskins was an uh, unconventional choice, but he was so good and he was so physical. Um, you know, his physicality and ability to, to look at Roger, who was a character that just wasn't there on the screen. He was just an imaginary character, um, was really extraordinary. So in the end, I think the cast was really amazing. Uh, but yeah, there's always people that, that turn down films and don't um, sign on. And that's that's pretty normal, I think. Now, you, you had mentioned Pete's Dragon. So th it's roughly like 10 years between uh, Pete's Dragon and Roger Rabbit. Do you think Roger Rabbit could have been done 10 years earlier? Or just the technology wasn't... Uh... Well, the technology was still slightly crude. It was still pencil-drawn animation. Um, without computers or anything else but the i think the biggest thing was the the filmmakers that zemeckis and the um artistic crew were a little more fearless when it came to moving the characters around and moving the camera around so the in older live action uh, animation combination movies the camera would be locked off with sandbags and you would never want to move it um the dogs are barking um <laughs> that's okay you can't hear mine because <laughs> she's yes, barking too <laughs> locked in the next room um yeah. so a, a lot of it was um just the freedom of uh expression that the uh, zemeckis brought to the show of being able to move the camera and then we would have to move the animation and draw it along with the camera movement so there was a lot of that kind of um mm. yeah just kind of 
uh, creativity that went into it to discard some of the older rules that apply to live action filmmaking and animation and start to um, approach it in a new way. Well, from, from that, you get your, your first production producing credit, which is Tummy Trouble, uh, you know, Robert, Roger Rabbit short, which involved also, like you said, Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy. Now, what sort of pressure comes with, you know, your first producing credit has Spielberg involved? Well, they, I, I, you know, they're surprisingly easy to work with as long as you're delivering uh, the goods. Um, <laughs> they're very supportive, their notes are good, um, and they're a very supportive community of people. So um, it's not, you know, some, some groups of, especially in Hollywood can be, um, you know, bitter screamers, cell phone throwing uh, kind of executives and that kind of thing. And you don't get any of that with, um, with most of the people I work with, either at Amblin or at Disney or whatever. There tend to be uh, professionals that are there because they love making movies. Uh, so I was lucky that way. Mm -hmm. Well, moving on to Beauty and the Beast, how did that movie come about for you? Well, um, we were finishing Roger Rabbit in London and um, Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, called and said he wanted to do, try doing uh, Beauty and the Beast. It was around the studio for a long time. I think Walt tried, uh, or at least it was on one of his lists of stories to develop for the future. Uh, it was always problematic because the main characters really didn't do anything in the, in the course of the movie. They would meet, so there's a beautiful bride and a ugly monster. And he would come down and say, will you marry me? And she would say no, and that was pretty much the movie. Um, and, and so I think the, the breakthrough with that was to, um, thanks to a variety of people, um, have a story that was much more about um, the growth of the beast and about this character who would redeem himself um, and slowly become more and more human through the second act and the introduction of things like the, the objects, the enchanted objects like clocks and teapots and candelabras. All of that was um, invented for our version of the movie and just made it more whimsical. It gave it more of a chance to be a musical. Uh, working with Howard and Allen was a, a, a great opportunity because Mermaid had just finished up uh, and Aladdin had gone into some story problems. So all of a sudden Howard and Allen were available and we were able to talk them into grabbing um, Beauty and the Beast and writing the song score for that. And of course that was a, a huge leg up for us because they brought so much um, entertainment and joy and uh, drama to the movie with their songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Howard really believed <clears throat> in the storytelling through songs and letting the songs tell the plot. So all those things kind of added up to be Beauty and the Beast. Well, the, the music is, is just fantastic. And, you, you know, I was going to ask you about uh, Ashman and Mencken, and you wrote and directed also the documentary, Howard, about, about Howard Ashman. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with him and, you know, just his music in general? Well, Howard was, um, you know, pretty much one-stop shopping when it came to storytelling. He wasn't necessarily a musician. He was a great singer understood musicals and understood musical theater better than anything I've ever, anyone I've ever known. Um, meaning he understood the genre of musical theater, but also where to place songs and how to musicalize parts of the plot to turn it into a musical, which is no small thing. I mean, a lot of people misunderstand musicals and they'll paste songs on a story and think it's a musical, but mm. uh, it's really not. I think Howard really focused us all on the true American Broadway musical, which was taking the key points of the plot where the characters are most in trouble or most in love and musicalizing those moments. And um, that's something Howard and Allen did beautifully in, in all of their work. And um, so it, it was good. I mean, working with them was, Howard was uh, living in New York at the time and spending a few weeks every month in Los Angeles. Um, so it was very demanding on all of us to really have that be important time where we could all work on the movie together. Sure. Um, and then eventually as he, he became sick and um, wasn't able to come to Los Angeles that much. And so we went to him and, uh, and then sadly he passed away before the movie was done, before he even saw it. But we got enough of an influx of his work along with some great, great people, uh, Kirk Wise, Gary Trousdale, our directors and our writers and um, amazing story people uh, that all added up to making Beauty and the Beast what it is. Mm. And you well, just what, you just mentioned uh, adding 
adding, you know, the characters like the enchanted objects. And is that how also how Gaston came in? Because Gaston to me is like one of the, the great villains in all of uh, Disney <laughs> Disney films. So how did that come about? How did he come about that character? <laughs> Well, he was, he, you know, he was not necessarily in the original fairy tale, but we knew we right. wanted someone who um, was the opposite of the beast. So if the beast was a ugly guy with the heart of gold, then Gaston had to be an incredibly handsome guy with a messed up heart. <laughs> and, um, and at first, Gaston was drawn as kind of a fop, as kind of a... Um, you know, a fancy dandy from the uh, 17th century. And that became a little, um, I don't know, there just wasn't much entertainment in it. And um, and then slowly, the, some of the drawings started su to suggest more of a mountain man, a hunter, uh, because the beast was a beast. And to have a threat to him would be, well, a hunter, obviously. Um, and in, in no small part, he's based on a character named Milus Gloriosus. Uh, and, and that will send your audience to Wikipedia. Oh, it's but, um, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, Milus Gloriosus is a character in Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum and also a character oh. <laughs> in, um, in, I think, in mythology. And he is a soldier and a brutish hunter uh, with massive biceps who comes marching into town um and is incredibly impressed with himself um so that's gaston and that's milus gloriosus so um you know i think that's there's a great song and funny thing happened to the forum uh, musical uh, on the way to the forum that's all about milus gloriosus and how he's co he's conquered the millions and brought peace to his people and thank god you have me and um, you know, he's, he's reminiscent, actually, of some modern politicians that we've seen recently, uh, not to mention any names, but um, very kind of narcissistic and all about himself. And that was perfect for Gaston. And then the fact that he was a hunter and had antlers everywhere was, uh, um, you know, another great visual thing. So that's where Gaston comes from. Oh, wow. oh yeah. So I, I, I can blame you guys because I still have antlers and all of my decorating as an earworm in my head constantly from that song it just it yeah. just cracks me up endlessly but uh you know speaking of that what what how much goes into what goes into deciding to stick uh to the how much to stick to the source material or you know changing it to, uh, to fit a disney movie because it always seems to me uh, historically at least from uh, certainly my experience every time i see a disney movie it feels like a disney movie and it becomes that through this process so where does that line come for you guys well it's interesting it kind of is a, a grassroots approach um in the last 50 years there's no walt disney to kind of guide that along although the there's a small group of people that created that Disney house style, not the least of which is Walt, but but still very important players were people like Joe Grant, who was head of the character department at Disney, or Bill Pete, who was one of the really crucial story people at Disney. Um, certainly the animators like uh, Milt Call. Um, so there's a lot of names that, that your audience may not have heard. Ken Anderson, um, who worked on those movies, Mark Davis, who designed uh, and worked on all the women like uh, Tinkerbell and Maleficent and uh, Cruella. And then, and then Walt said, well, Mark, go over and work on Disneyland. And Mark was like, okay, I've never done that, but I'll do that. And so he designs the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and designs a bunch of stuff for the Haunted Mansion and the Jungle Cruise. And so again, you have these unique artists who were jacks of all trade, who were willing to do anything mm. um, uh, and did for Walt and, uh, and Walt challenged them and believed in them. And I think that was what was so unique. So these guys invented kind of that, pro that process and the look of a Disney film. Freddie Moore was another one who designed the look and the characters and the movement of animation in Snow White of the Dwarves and really looked like uh, what we would consider Disney animation. Um, so, and then you have my generation, which is kind of the students of all those uh, men and women who invented the animation process back in the 20s and 30s, and we are the next generation. And so we were just fans and grew up on that stuff and had our own version of it. I mean, I, I think Little Mermaid and Beauty and Aladdin and Lion King are not completely like Pinocchio and, and uh, you know, Snow White and some of those films. 
I, I honestly don't think we reached the level of artistry they reached in films like Pinocchio. Pinocchio was pretty much an artistic miracle. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever got to that point. Um, but we, we got great stories. And I think we did excel and maybe did even better than the original Disney movies in terms of our storytelling. And that was our strong suit. And part, part of that was the musicals and the, the songs we had. And part of that is we had just great men and women in the story department uh, writing and creating these things. And so you have a, you have, when you're sitting in those rooms coming up with ideas for movies, you have a group instinct about what is entertaining and you're making the movies for yourself and your family and for the kids on the, on the block that live around you. You know, you're, there's no, there's no executives that come in the room um, that tell you it has to be a certain way. There's no consumer products people that come in and say, we need a princess doll. Um, I mean, you might think that was the case, but it wasn't ever the case. Mm. You really are there making something for the audience and the audience is your boss. Um, well, that's what, that's what and, I was about to ask you. I mean, how, how much autonomy do you have when you're working for Disney? I mean, do they oversee every little thing or no, you can just go ahead and do what you would like on a lot of the work? In general, the group, meaning the, you know, the myself and the directors and the story team uh, had a lot of autonomy and um, we would always have to present to executives, but um, they were busy with other things and they wanted us to keep going and making these movies. And so you had tremendous autonomy to make it interesting. And the only time we were ever stopped um, is if we weren't sure if something crossed a line, was it too intense? Mm -hmm. We never put, we never really put sexuality into the movies. We would put something perhaps once in a while that was too violent. Um, uh, Scar's uh, death comes to mind and mm -hmm. uh, there, yeah. you know, he falls off a cliff and, and in the end we illustrated it with a shadow on a wall. Um, and that's you know something they did in Pinocchio and many other films. So you're not seeing him get ripped apart by hyenas. Not that that wouldn't be cool, but um, you're seeing it as a shadow on the wall and something that is not going to be. Um, it's it's more of a poetic feel. filmic license than something that's too intense for small children. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, having said that, the films of Walt Disney are at times very intense. If you look at Pinocchio and sure. Pleasure Island and Stromboli and <clears throat> Oh gosh! The yes. intensity of little boys being turned into to donkeys and all that, uh, Bambi's mother getting shot. We we often cited those in terms of trying to be brave with Mufasa being killed or with um, um, you know Belle and the Beast uh, fighting back wolves out in the wilderness or you know whatever. The intensity is not bad, and you need that. You need the drama. Um, so really, you have to be kind of self-policing and um, and really aware and an advocate for your audience. You don't want to betray your audience. You want to be um, loyal to the audience when they buy their ticket and go see your movie to be able to have an expectation that it's going to be dramatic and funny as can be and, uh, and, 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 you know, within the bounds of a family movie. And so... It's eventually, Beauty and the Beast, I mean, gets nominated for Best Picture. How validating, how excited was everyone when that happens? Yeah, well, that goes back to something we were talking about a while ago, where we were really trying to educate the audience um, to look at animation and understand that it was an art form. It's a great American art form. Um, I mean, certainly there are international animators that are brilliant. But feature animation, character animation in the Disney style is obviously very American. And so uh, we, for Beauty and the Beast in particular, we had a screening at the New York Film Festival, which would ne New York would never dream in a million years of accepting any Disney film. <laughs> it, it, you know, here, here's a, a town full of incredibly erudite uh, critics, and, and the idea of having a Disney animated film in the festival was um, really unique. But to their credit, they saw that it was something new that Disney was bringing back a part of their legacy and then bringing it back in a fresh way. And so we showed an unfinished version at the New York Film Festival. And that was really a turning point where people understood that these were drawn by hand by people. They were painted with paint. Um, and and uh, we did museum shows at the time. Oh. And many things that actually Walt did in his era, he did museum shows with Sleeping Beauty and other, other movies. Um, but it was really an education process. And I think that led to the 
academy uh, understanding that it was an art form that could be acknowledged. And so back in the day when there were only five Best Picture nominations, to get a Best Picture nomination was extraordinary. And, um, and you know, and it was very deliberate. We it was courted. You know, we we definitely went after the Golden Globe Award to to try to set up the op opportunity to get a, um, an Oscar nomination. In fact, I think I have it here somewhere. Hold on. Oh wow. <laughs> Here it is. Um, <laughs> Lovely. So, <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what else do you need? Um, so, you know, we, we would get, try to hit some of these milestones of awards and things, uh, which is very common. You know, anybody who wins a best picture or uh, best actor um, campaigns, it's like a political campaign. You really campaign amongst the Oscar, um, Oscar voters. So it was a real honor. It was a real honor mm -hmm. to be um, acknowledged because Walt Disney never really got that acknowledgement. Sure. Um, and even, I mean, even to this day, you know, 30 years later, people talk about that. And um, so it was a, a real honor, I think, and not just not just for me, but for, totally for the artist and for the studio um, to have that kind of acknowledgement for the industry. Mm -hmm. I was I was absolutely blown away when the nomination came out and I was so excited uh, to, and of course, watched. I watched Academy's, I always watched Academy Awards, but um I, you know, in my, of course, humble opinion, it should have won um, that year, <laughs> but you. Silence of the Lambs took the honor, which is a great movie, but of course, completely different. And it's so hard to, you know, you put these, you know, these two films up against each other. And I know it didn't happen until a lot of years lady, later, but do you think Beauty and the Beast influenced the Academy to create the best animated feature award? I think it did, um, because the quality of animation stayed high. And uh, through uh, some really great movies at Disney Animation, at Pixar, whatever, and um, and I think that you know you you could look at it in a jaded way and say, well, the Academy didn't want animation to take any of its Best Picture nominations, so they created this kind of side category over here that would marginalize animation. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it that way at all. I feel like it's um, it's a great tribute to be able to. Uh, you know, put animation on a pedestal and say it's an important art form. It's a very lucrative art form. It's, it, it makes money for the industry. Um, and these days, there's ten and there's probably fifteen or twenty animated features every year, which is mm -hmm. so different than when Beauty came out. Um, so there's enough candidates where you can look at the like the nominees this year. Where there was uh, a movie called Flea about. Uh, uh, immigrants. Um, it, it, there's, you know, main studio movies. There's, um, you know, just a variety of products coming out, and they're all good. I mean, my God, there's so much mm -hmm. animation going on right now, uh, and in live action movies, like a lot of the Marvel movies, are becoming more animated. So mm -hmm. the idea of um, it used to be long ago where you say, well, what's animated? Well, it has to be like a flying elephant or something like that. Not anymore. I mean, anything can be animated. Anything can be turned into um, uh, an animated movie, and and that's great. It's the way it should be. The art form has moved ahead a tremendous mm. amount. Mm. Well, you you also produced Lion King, another great movie, <clears throat> still the highest grossing traditionally animated film of all time. Uh, can you tell us how that film came about for you? Uh, yeah, um, Jeffrey uh, Katzenberg, Peter Schneider, Roy Disney were on a plane in Europe selling Oliver and Company uh, with press junkets. And um, Jeffrey said, you know, someday we should do a coming of age story. And Roy said, yeah, like Bambi in Africa. And so that was the beginning of it. Um, it we called it Bambi in Africa for a long time. Oh my. And, um, and, uh, and then early drafts of the movie were called um, King of the Jungle. And uh, it really was an exploration into, can we do uh, something set in nature that's very much like Bambi, um, that's about growing up and about that day in your life when you have to grow up and accept responsibility for um, being an adult. And sometimes that comes with the birth of a child, sometimes it comes with the death of a parent or you know whatever. So it was dealing with some pretty uh, deep issues, um, our relationships with our fathers and Mm -hmm. um, Rob Minkoff and Roger Allers directed that movie, and the three of us had really good relationships with our dads. That's really a movie about um, that. 
In fact, we were going to dedicate it to our fathers. Uh, and, and then it, sadly, at the last minute, Frank Wells passed away in a helicopter crash, and we ended up dedicating it to him. But it's a movie about our, our relationships with our fathers and our ancestors, and that we're walking around with all this uh, genetic and um, you know philosophical information from our uh, generations past, and that we have a certain obligation to move that forward um, and to be the best we can be. And so those are really kind of uh, fun, deep issues to deal with. And, and, and at the same time, we had a farting warthog and uh, <laughs> funny stuff in the movie as well. <laughs> so it, it really came out of that uh, Bambi in Africa growing up kind of idea. Now, was it true that, that ABBA was approached to do the music for that? Yeah, one of the first people on was Tim Rice, because Tim had come in to fill in for Howard Ashman when Howard passed away. And he finished some of the songs on Aladdin, uh, like um, A Whole New World was Tim Rice's lyrics. Um, and he, had, he would work with uh, Benny and with the people from ABBA on Chess, which was a right. West End um, Broadway musical that was really successful. And so they were one of the first people he approached and thought they would be fantastic for this. And, you know, they would have been. I think we think of them in a very um, oh, no, I love narrow, <laughs> narrow box. But um, but talk about narrow box. Um, Elton John came up. Tim had never worked with Elton John. Elton John had never written a musical or a Broadway show. And when we heard Elton John, we thought, Elton John? Because um, <laughs> we were honestly thinking... Um, Lady Smith, Black Mombazo, Paul Simon, Graceland, uh -huh. you know, all those kinds of things, which were very of the moment and, and terrific. Like the Graceland album was a huge hit. Uh -huh. um, and we thought, wow, that would be the kind of music. Well, in the end, we got that kind of music and more. Um, Elton turned out to be a great collaborator. Um, he had, I can't say he had no ego about the process, but he's remarkably collaborative and remarkably uh, would hit our requests for songs and things right on the money. And if he didn't, he would be happy to go back and rewrite something. Like he wrote Circle oh. of Life a couple of times. Mm. He wrote, um, Tim wrote the lyrics to Can You Feel the Love Tonight about 20 times. So they were very willing to move things around and, and collaborate and change things um, in a way that really benefited the movie. And then Hans Zimmer coming in and writing the score in a... Um, you know, in a way that really borrowed heavily from African music and indigenous music and bringing in somebody like Lebo M, the singer who sings that opening cry in the wilderness. Um, that kind of thing was um, really fresh, new, risky, scary, but uh, all mm. worked out in the end. Mm. You, you had such a great cast in Lion King as well. I, I, we had interviewed uh, we had interviewed Tommy Chong, who said that, you know, he had been approached too, but you had still had some uh, great great cast members there can you tell us any anecdotes about making that movie with with all that great cast well it i think our approach to it was to do a colorblind cast which i mean later when um the the kind of live action version of lion king was done just a couple of years ago mm -hmm. it was very much an african or african-american cast which was uh, and rightly so um i think back then i don't think we felt that kind of particular pressure, although we knew we wanted a colorblind cast of uh, a variety of voices. So it was okay for James Earl Jones's son to be Matthew Broderick. Um, it was okay to have, you know, just a variety of people regardless of their skin color because you weren't seeing that on the screen. Um, so James Earl Jones was great to work yeah. with. Um, uh, really a pro, really, um, you know, really an amazing guy to work with. And, and, um, and we were able to try some things with him. Like when he's when he's a ghost, we put five microphones around his head. So you have a left, center, right, and rear microphones. Um, so he, the audience is almost in his head when he's speaking. Um, and his voice obviously is fantastic. Um, Whoopi Goldberg, Cheech Marin, um, amazing people. Uh, and then Nathan and Ernie, Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella were Broadway talent that not a lot of people had heard of. They were in Guys and Dolls on Broadway and they came in an audition for the hyenas. And um and they were fine. You know, they they were fine. But then Roger Allers, who was one of the directors, said, Would you guys stick around and just read these new sides, these new pages on Puma Timon? Um, because we were thinking about Eddie Murphy or different people for Timon. 
And so they said, sure. And they stayed around. And since they had worked together in Guys and Dolls, they had this chemistry between the two of them. Mm. And they came back and just knocked everybody on the floor with how funny they were. Um, and so they were great. And we recorded them as much together as we could because they had such a strong relationship. And a lot of their material is ad-libbed. You know, we, we would write things, but a lot of the, you know, what do you want me to do? Dress and drag and do the hula? Just was making stuff up on the fly. Um, and you want that. You want that energy from the voice talents uh, sure. because that is gold yeah. to the animators who have to make those characters perform. Um, so great cast um, all around, you know, to be able to deal with those people and the singing demands that they had. And, and it was never about star power because, you know, the Circle of Life song, we always thought, well, we'll, we'll get um, Harry Belafonte or we'll get Seal or someone to sing that song, a star. And in the end, Carmen Twilley sings it. Well, nobody knew who Carmen Twilley was. She was actually a, um, a singer from the chorus. It was a background singer, basically, in recording sessions. And she came in and sang the demo of it just so that we'd have something to listen to. And we fell in love with it. And we kept looking for somebody else to sing that opening song and we could never beat it. So mm -hmm. Carmen, who is, uh, you know, was at the time a relative unknown, um, is the person who sings that song. Or Lebo, that, that African voice you hear throughout the whole movie was parking cars for a valet parking service in oh, Los wow. Angeles. And he was a refugee from South Africa because apartheid was just breaking loose and uh, dissolving in South Africa. In fact, he voted for the first time in 1994. So mm. Africa was kind of in the air when Lion King came out. Mm. And uh, Hans Zimmer was looking for him. And, and literally a few um, hours before we showed up at Hans's studio, he found Lebo and Lebo came by. And uh, we said, Lebo, we need this kind of cry in the wilderness at the beginning of the movie. It's kind of a John the Baptist thing, you know, where you're, you're saying, you know, make way for the new king. And, um, and, and so he, kept, he said, okay, and there, it wasn't in a recording studio, it was in a room with a microphone. And uh, he tried a couple things and then came out with that thing that we're all used to, uh, as kind of an improv on what he thought might work. So he, along with the planning and the, the writing and the, the serious nature of telling a story, you also have to be open to improvisation and chance and take those opportunities when they come along. Oh my gosh, that's, I just, I love, I, I love this stuff to death. So now you go on to Hunchback, which is another really beautiful movie with a great soundtrack. And these are, kind of, again, more of the behind the scenes stories I love hearing about. I read that Meatloaf and Mandy Patinkin um, had, were considered for Quasimodo. Yeah, I mean, we, we would do uh, a lot of reading and casting for all these parts. Yeah. Um, and that's true. Yeah, Meatloaf and, and uh, Mandy both came in. Um, and, you know, you can never say that they don't work because they, they're they amazing. And Mandy Patinkin is a genius, you know, so mm -hmm. it's not that they don't work. It's just they might not have the right, um, oh, tone for what you're looking for. And, um, you know, it, it, it just wasn't quite a fit for what we had. Um, so, you know, in the, in the same as the case with uh, like Demi Moore, as she was a great, um, strong character to play a Roma gypsy character, uh, because a lot of the movie is about the oppression of, uh, uh, you know, of people. And it's a very timely movie still, um, whether it be a, a person that's uh, physically uh, disabled or a person who's part of a, a race uh, like the Roma. Um, in, in Europe during the time. And she was able to play that strength and, um, or Tony Jay who played Frollo, um, the bad guy uh, from the, you know, from the church. Um, those are, it, those were tough characters to cast because you want them to be strong and yet have the ability to play the musical parts um, and, and uh, you know, all the demands that you have uh, in these movies. And, and so in the end you would cast and, and try several people um, and then, and then you get lucky with somebody who just was a fit like to me or like Kevin Klein who played Phoebus or, or even like Robbie Benson, who was the beast, you know, he's probably the last person you thought of to cast as the beast, but he was just a perfect fit in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, now you went back, you, you, you just, you did Beauty and the Beast and you're making a live action version of Hunchback. I read, so how difficult is it to go back and revisit something that, you know, was so great the first time and now 
you know, decide to change it up a little bit? Well, luckily there's uh, fresh faces and new writers and directors that come along to reinterpret things. And I, I always believe stories are meant to be told and uh, they're not meant to sit on a shelf for too long. And it's been over 20 years since mm -hmm. these movies have come out. So it's appropriate to me to tell those stories again and um, to be able to bring in new writers and new directors and a new cast to try to retell that story. And of course you get the benefit of new songs like, um, oh, Alan Menken's working on Little Mermaid right now, um, a new version of that. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, and so you get some new songs from Alan for that. Um, and uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda is writing the lyrics for that. So you get Lin-Manuel who was incredibly inspired by Howard Ashman and the films that we made back in the 90s, now has grown up and a brilliant writer and uh, is collaborating with Alan on the retelling of these stories. And um, that's a cool thing. That's really great. Right. And, and so you, the original movies will always be there. Um, they'll never get lost. You can always pop in and look at Lion King um, or Mermaid, but you can also um, enjoy, you know, Kenneth Branagh's version of Cinderella or, uh, you know, some of the retellings that have been done lately. And uh, the retelling of those stories is great. There's not that many stories in, in, in the universe. And so uh, it, it makes sense. Um, it, in fact, if you look at some of the, the upcoming slates of, of all the studios, you think like, is there anything fresh out there? But um, <laughs> it, it makes sense sometimes to go back and revisit those great stories of the past, like Maleficent, you know, it was a different yeah. spin on the Sleeping, Sleeping uh, Beauty story with a character invented by Mark Davis. Mm. You know, so here you have this animator who's eventually went on to design theme parks who invented Maleficent from who's not in the original fairy tale. And that ends up being something Angelina Jolie wants to do and turns into a series of movies that's a huge hit for the studio. You just mentioned music. I just want to ask in the in the 90s, you had all those string of great musicals. And then the studio seemed like it shifted away from making the animated musicals. Was that just a conscious decision or just a shift in audience taste that they decided to stay away from that a little bit? Well, it, that's a great question. I'll be I'll be as honest as I can uh, with the answer, which is I think you, uh, I'll, uh, it's like sports. You, you have winning seasons and you have slumps. And I think a lot of the movies, um, let's take a look at the last 30 years maybe, um, you have a bell curve of, of movies in terms of box office. Uh, some are very appreciated in their time but don't age very well. Other movies become huge hits over time, like Nightmare Before Christmas. But when Nightmare came out, nobody went to see it. It was not a hit when it came out. Same with Emperor's New Groove. And now when I go to like Comic-Con or conventions or whatever, and, and people say, oh, um, you know, what did you work on, Don? And I'll, I'll, I'll proudly say, well, Lion King. And, I'll, and then they find out I worked on Emperor's New Groove and they go, oh my God, I know every line of that movie. And, you know, that's their, <laughs> that's their go-to movie because they were the right age when it came out and it's their cult movie. And um, so one never knows, um, but certainly like sports, like the arts of any kind uh, and like business, I suppose, is you have an ebb and flow of success and less than success. And you see that in Walt Disney's life. You see it in Pixar, you see it in Disney, you see it in Warner Brothers. Um, and that's what happens to all of us. So I think, um, you know, you look at Disney now and they're turning out some really incredible movies like mm -hmm. Moana and, um, you know, so many great movies from Disney animation. Um, and, and there's been years when the movies weren't that great. Uh, and it's not that the effort goes into them is any different or the budget or the desire to make a great movie. Like we made, I, I produced Atlantis and we wanted to do something different. Instead of going down Main Street through the castle to Fantasyland, we deliberately said, we're gonna go down to the hub and turn left and go to Adventureland. And Atlantis is an Adventureland movie. And everybody got that and made that movie. And again, now it's a cult movie. Everybody's mm -hmm. Disney Plus is out. Everybody loves that movie. Um, but at the time it wasn't the massive success that Lion King was. But um, you, you know, you put these movies out there and eventually they find their audience. Well, you just mentioned all right, Atlantis and Emperor's New Group. I, I had 
count me in this part. I love Emperor's New Groove, and I always have. I love David Spade. Patrick Warburton kills me in everything that he's in, and I I still watch. I laugh every single time that I watch that movie at the same lines. I know what lines are coming. What, what is it about that? What do you remember about making it? And what do you think that? When did you first start seeing? It, I guess that it it had become this cult classic that uh, got this second life. Well, it, that movie went through um, the meat grinder when it came to um, the production of it. it it started out as something a little more dramatic. Um, Roger Allers, who directed Lion King, was directing it. Uh, and it was about an a Incan boy in the Incan civilization who roped the sun. Very mythological uh, and beautiful. It's amazing artwork done on it. Um, it wasn't very funny. And I think about that time, oh, I think we were all kind of feeling like we wanted to try something different. And um, so through a, a number of different reasons, uh, Mark Dindal came into the project and Mark was the director on that movie. And Mark is a ridiculously funny, uh, irreverent person who put together a story team of writers uh, like um, Dave Reynolds, who was a writer on the Conan O'Brien show and mm -hmm. um, you know a variety of people who made it into what it was. Um, and I think it was just, we were all ready for that. I don't think there was any expectation while we were making it that it was going to be a billion dollar hit. You know, I think it was going to be, if we were lucky, a stand up single, you know, if we were, <laughs> if we were able to hit the ball. Um, but we knew we had um, great music with Sting, even though we threw out half the songs he had written for the earlier version. Um, and Sting, <laughs> Sting kept resigning and we kept uh, uh, the, the producer, um, Randy Fulmer kept calling him up and saying, Okay, well, we're going to go on to the next song. And Sting kept saying, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the project. No, you're not. You're, you're going to keep showing up. And he did. To his credit, he kept showing up. Um, but the, the movie's uh, beautiful, irreverent. Uh, the cast is probably the best ever. And then the writing is really clever. It's kind of mm -hmm. Simpsons level silly, stupid writing with, you know, Eartha Kitt in the same movie <laughs> as David Spade. And it's just <laughs> one of those things. Happy accident. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of that movie and, and um, yeah, the whole crew did a great job on it. But it was just a different tone. You know, it wasn't the self-serious princess movie. It was just a totally different departure. And boy, did we need it by that time. You know, <laughs> if you have meat and potatoes every night for five years, you're ready for some tacos after a while. You know, you want to have some chimichanga. And so that was our chimichanga. <laughs> well, it might not be tacos, but um, we want to ask about Haunted Mansion with Eddie Murphy. Um, mm -hmm. That and Pirates of the Caribbean came at, out roughly at the same time. What do you remember about the discussions to turn the rides into movies? Well, Haunted, uh, yeah, um, Haunted Mansion was, um, wow, wonderful and terrible. It was the only good thing... Um, about Pirates is it really pushed us to be the best movie we possibly could be. We had great art direction. We had great people that loved the attraction. Rob Minkoff, great director. Um, Eddie Murphy, pretty brilliant, but Eddie had been off of some not so great movies like Pluto Nash. And I think his star was fading a little bit at the time. Um, I think the story works. I think the movie itself works, um, but it, it just, the elements of that movie uh, were an experiment. Can you make an attraction into a movie? Um, and then somewhere along that line, then the Pirates of the Caribbean film came out and it was terrific and we knew it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we knew when we saw that and saw what, uh, and they went through a lot of conflict too with Johnny Depp's character. And, you know, he's, you know, he shows up with a golden tooth uh, and, and half drunk on stage. And that's gonna be the character is a challenging character to accept for the studio. Um, but thank God they did because it was a really fresh take on that story. Mm -hmm. So uh, it goes back to the idea of reinvention that you have to kind of reinvent these stories and um, and the basic Haunted Mansion story or the basic Pirate story are good, but you have to bring in fresh elements um, to anything like that to make it um, spectacular. And, um, you know, whether it's a casting person or a, a visual effect idea or whatever, and that's what really makes those movies excel. You're not just repeating the the ride. You're not just doing the movie of the Matterhorn. You're you know you're turning it into something completely different. Well, that's that's an interesting point that you just made. I mean, because I mean, Haunted Mansion is my favorite ride. So when you're you're converting it into a movie, 
how much you know talk goes into like you know giving fan service with like a little bit of easter eggs thrown in from the ride or a fresh new take i mean what kind of discussion does that entail well we were really aware of the um the backstory of the ride and all the history of it and the work that yale gracie and a lot of uh people did on the ride even going back to when it was uh a walk through wax museum kind of place, mm -hmm. uh, the museum of the weird. Um, so we were very aware of the history and the mythology that went into it. Um, and so, yes, you want to give Easter eggs, you want to give some satisfaction to the audience that they're going to see uh, Madame Leota. They're going to see some things that, that they can point to and say, oh, that's, you know, that's what I remember from the attraction. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you have to incorporate those in a way that maybe they aren't in the ride. In the ride, they're kind of vignettes and one-offs. And in a movie, they have to be integrated more in part of the plot and be more um, uh, more of a narrative element. And um, mm -hmm. and so that's the challenge. And, that, and how was Eddie Murphy like to work with? He was good. You know, what's funny about, and this happens to a lot of comedians, is they tend to be somewhat quiet and introverted when you first work with them. Mm -hmm. The same yeah. is true of um, oh, Steve Martin comes to mind. When the camera rolls, then they light up and they turn into Steve Martin or Eddie Murphy. Right. So Eddie's a, he's an observer. He's a student. He, you know, God, he would go home at nighttime and watch uh, dozens of movies to try to inform his character and his personality and his look and what he would wear and everything else. So he's a real student of acting and what it would take in the part. Um, so a real pro, I have to say, a real pro to to work with. And I think you don't do as many movies as he has and have the success he has without having that real pro kind of uh, side to you where you know how to prepare and show up and and uh, make the jokes work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that to be true of Chris Rock. I had the opportunity to work with him on a project and he was very much the same way. He was like very, very kind of a little bit introverted but then all yeah. of a sudden when he went to work it was like wow that's you know there's there's the Chris rock, Chris rock we we know and love now i know there's another haunted mansion movie in the works are there any other um ride movies being planned maybe it's a small world 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 after 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 all <laughs> i probably but i don't know i mean i don't oh, I, okay. I i'm on to other things so um you know, I think we've been developing a, a Hunchback of Notre Dame film for a long time, which is great. Um, but I, you know, if there's a good idea out there for a, an attraction, um, absolutely. You know, who knew that Jungle Cruise would make a good attraction? But it's a great mm -hmm. movie. You know, and it's a yeah. fun mm -hmm. Indiana Jones kind of take on that idea. Absolutely. Um, so there's there's always a way if there's someone inventive enough to look at it. Um, you know, look at a ride, look at a do the Monsanto movie or whatever, and have have a something that is um, fun for the audience to revisit. And it ha I mean, what's a little bit different now is um, the movies are going into the parks. It used to be that the parks were standalone experiences. Mm -hmm. So you would go to Adventureland, and the Jungle Cruise wasn't based on any movie. The Haunted Mansion wasn't based on any movie. Those were just uh, in the collective real estate of the audience. Everybody knew what a haunted house was. Everybody knew what a pirate was. So the collective consciousness of the audience said, oh, pirates, well, let's go see what that is. <laughs> um, now, the, the um, more common approach is to say, let's take Avatar or let's take um, Star Wars and put those already a, a developed, baked um, premise as a movie. Let's put those narratives in the parks. And that's a, it's mm -hmm. exactly backwards of what the original parks did. Uh, and I, I'm not making a value judgment on that. I think those are terrific experiences. Um, it's just a different approach. So it's a little easier because the movies are already made and then you can go visit the land. Mm, mm. I, I do want to ask you about uh, Disney Nature, your, your, uh, the ones that you produced and they're such great films on there. You can catch them all on Disney Plus. Uh, how did that come about? How did that idea to start uh, doing these type of documentaries come about? Well, the uh, nature movies were very much a part of Walt Disney's kind of genesis after the war, um, World War II, um, and there had been a terrible labor strike at the studio, and he just thought, I'm going to come back with a lot of different approaches and diversify. He didn't want to put all of his uh, eggs in one basket, uh, as he had done with animation, because if animation were to go belly up, then they would be um, uh, screwed, if you'll excuse the language. Um, so he decided to get into eventually 
um, the television and theme parks and all these other places. Well, one of those was nature movies. Now we are bombarded with nature movies. You can turn on any channel, any time and see a nature movie. But at the time, it wasn't the case. Um, so to create Seal Island or just one of his early nature movies was really different. And um, his True Life Adventure series was one of a kind, you know, and, and he couldn't get any uh, studio to really release that movie. He had worked before with um, RKO to release his animated films, but he would show them the nature movies and they would say, well, you know, we don't get this, good luck. <laughs> and um, that's when he and Roy founded Buena Vista Distribution because it's like, well, we'll just build our own distribution company to distribute their nature movies. So the core of a lot of the Disney businesses come from those nature movies and, and their early ones all won Oscars as the best documentaries. So they were mm. really well received by the audience. They were short, they were like 45 minutes long. So, um, but brilliantly done by a variety of filmmakers who would go out in the field for years and film, you know, seals or lemmings falling off a of cliffs, which is a whole other story. Um, and those stories became really popular with the audience. And, but that was really carved out by Walt and nobody wanted them. And that's kind of a typical story for Walt and Roy Disney is to take something that they loved and turn it into a, a project. And then at Disneyland, they had, uh, you know, True Adventureland was originally called True Life Adventureland. Oh. And um, oh. it was simplified down to Adventureland, but that was meant to be the place you went to experience these True Life Adventures. And that's why the Jungle Cruise is there and that kind of thing. So uh, you can start to see how all these things kind of germinated and turned into what we now know as Disneyland and uh, the Disney nature movies and and now Net Geo and some of the nature things that are on Disney Plus are just spectacular. Yeah. Um, so that was fun. I, I loved working with those guys. We worked with, with a lot of people from BBC Nature, um, people that go out and film chimpanzees for years at a time. That one's a great one. Really <laughs> unique people, um, but incredibly dedicated, very funny, long suffering, and uh, their movies were really fun to work on. Are you a big Disney file in general? Yeah, I am. I'm not a historian. I'm not a, um, you know, as somebody that knows everything about, um, you know, everything at Disney, but I admire a lot of the people and uh, I am inspired by a lot of the people. And um, it's not to say everybody was perfect at Disney or everybody today is perfect at Disney. We're all human beings, but I think the ethics and the aesthetic that has driven Disney for a hundred years is um, pretty fantastic. And, I, and I, I still get inspired by that, inspired by the story of uh, Walt Disney and Roy Disney, and, and mm -hmm. especially inspired by the artists um, that kind of invented theme parks and animation because I got to work with them and see that they, you know, they put their pants on one leg at a time and they were just dedicated to doing great work. And, um, you know, they're very normal people driven by a passion to do great entertainment so that you and I go to the theme parks and are blown away. And that's a special kind of person. And those people inspire me still today. Mm -hmm. Well, I am very proud to say that I have one of my original harmonica props from Witch Mountain. Um, so from all <laughs> cool. the movies you've made for them. Yeah, I do, I do. It's like, <laughs> I, I, I talk about this constantly. It's right next to my television on a shelf. And so I see it every, uh, all day, all the time. But from all the movies you made for them, were there any props that that you kept? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my house isn't terribly decorated with Disney stuff, although I have a shelf of maquettes, uh, which are the the sculptures oh, that we yes. make oh my for gosh. animated movies. Yeah, um, for the animators to study, and you can probably see them behind me. There's, uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. You know, every, everybody's back here. The beast. Oh wow! And, uh, I see the beast. Right. Yes. This okay, that's awesome. fantastic. And, and, uh, everyone. <laughs> so th those are my friends. And uh, if oh, I get lonely, I can reach back and grab one of those. And, um, you know, those are probably the nicest things that I've, I've hung on to. Mm. Um, you know, otherwise I'd, I, I would be a hoarder and I would be impossibly, <laughs> you know, my garage is already full of too many things. So <laughs> I wanted to tell us a little bit about Stone Circle Pictures. Oh, you know, about, oh, it's been 10 years ago or more. Well, it's interesting. I got to a point where I had to um, decide whether I was going to keep going and made, make animated films or move on. And it was a really hard decision. 
Mm. I, in the end, decided to move on for some simple reasons. One, I got some validation from the idea that because Walt Disney moved on from animation after a while, mm. it's a very intense activity. Mm. But I also had things to say. I, I wanted to make documentaries about social issues that meant something to me. And I especially wanted to make documentaries about artists and artists that were my heroes, like Tyrus Wong, who uh, art directed um, Bambi, or Howard Ashman. Um, and so that's what I've done. I've made, in, in the end, I think I've made more documentaries now than I have animated films. And mm -hmm. so this last 10 or 15 years has been all about that. Um, it's a art form that I strongly suggest to all of you out there because you can go out and buy the equipment and make a really high quality documentary uh, for pennies, depending, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you could a long time ago. Yeah. I shoot a lot of my, you know, a lot of the Howard Ashman documentary I shot on my iPhone in oh, 4K. Oh. You know, it's it's very approachable. Or I have, you know, or I'll get a GoPro, a GoPro 10 yeah. now available from Go, um, <laughs> and, and shoot it in in a very um, a tiny camera that shoots extremely high quality. Um, and so that kind of thing it makes it very uh, gratifying as a filmmaker. Uh, doing an animated film with 300 people over four years is one experience that I will always treasure. But I was ready for an experience that was a smaller experience. Uh, you can make a, a documentaries with five people uh, and, and tiny budgets. Um, and, and I make them for only Disney and only for PBS um, mm -hmm. because I, I admire both companies. They both have a lot in common. Um, and I've been on the board of PBS out here in Southern California for a while. And um, so I'll, I'll do documentaries for them because I love the kind of programming they both do. Um, for example, I have a, a documentary for this Christmas called Christmas with Walt Disney um, that I'm working on right now. And it's a, it's a movie I made 10 years ago for Diane Disney Miller. And it was literally, I mean, that's what it's about. It's about celebrating Christmas with Walt and his family. Oh, nice. And um, it showed at the museum for 10 years just to a few people and now Disney plus picked it up and wants to show it to uh, you know 100 million people on the cable service so that'll be out there at the holiday season which I'm really proud of um, or I did the walkthrough of the uh, Disney archives not too long ago and, and spent a couple of days shooting running through the archives showing everybody the cool collection of stuff they have there mm. um, yeah. and that's on Disney plus so those are the kinds of things I really enjoy doing now and I've I've had so many uh, blessings in my career um, that I feel like I can play with some of those things now. And I, you know, I, I've, I've done one of the first documentaries I did for Stone Circle, and that's my production company that is uh, produces these documentaries. And I created it for that reason. The first documentary I did was about a guy named Mike Carroll. Mike Carroll is the photographer for Disney Magazine when that existed. And he also did the Burn Bomb Travel Guides um, mm. for, and and back in 1988, he saw that there was, he was, he was a uh, photojournalist for the Boston Globe at the same time. And he saw there was a need in, in Romania because Ceausescu and the Iron Curtain had fallen and he raised a bunch of money and went over there and started an organization called Romanian Children's Relief. And he's not Romanian. He's, he has nothing to do with Romania, but he wanted to help. And now 30 years later, this same guy, I talked to him this week, actually, he still has an organization going he has 60 employees and he's taking care of 800 refugees from the ukraine who mm. have flooded into romania and are in his program now mothers and children uh and he's supplying them not not necessarily with food and clothing because there's plenty of people for that but he's working with boston um hospital to supply them with coaching for uh you know just trauma and some of the things they've been through so here's a guy who's very Disney, who's called to action by something that's happening in the real world. Uh, and and boy, what an inspiring guy he is. Um, that's why I started Stone Circle is to tell those stories. Wow, wow. Well, you've also authored several books on animation, such as Drawn to Life and the Disney Animation Kit. Um, have you thought about teaching a master class on it? It's funny you should say that because I, I oh. have, and some people have asked if I would, um, mm. particularly, particularly about storytelling. You know, I think there's there's better people than I, like uh, people like Eric Goldberg or Andreas Deja or Glenn Keane that can teach animation beautifully. Um, I'm really interested in storytelling and why we need stories, why stories are kind of the currency of our life and how we communicate. Um, 
so yeah, I think I think at some point I need to do that just to sit down and make a web series or something on YouTube um, that can kind of communicate what it is that I think is important about storytelling. I love teaching, I, I, although I don't want to go into the, uh, I've, I've taught at Chapman University and USC and some different places just as a one-off, you know, just a lectures and things. Um, I don't want to be a full-time faculty member um, so I still like making movies, but I do like to share what I know. Not that what I know is is so precious, but um, I, I feel like it's it's good to at least share that and challenge other people to uh, kind of gather their thoughts about what they think about storytelling or what they think about social issues or whatever. Oh, that would be great. I, uh, you should do that online. I'll, I'll look forward to Absolutely. that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, yeah. I, I, I will. Thank you for encouraging me. I thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so on the same subject, now, my son is like all into animation right now. He practices every day. <laughs> so what advice can you give to other you know, young animators that are looking to break in? Well, he'll, he will be rich. Um, it's a huge time. <laughs> it's a great time for animators right now. A great time because every movie is animated. Mm -hmm. So there's animators working on um, all the Marvel movies, all the Star Wars movies, all the DC movies. Um, every studio in town, Warner Brothers, uh, Paramount is making animated features. Um, it's an international business. You can work in animation in Los Angeles or um, London or Vancouver or Tokyo or China. Um, and there's a demand. There's a huge demand for visual effects artists and animators right now. Um, as with any craft, as with playing the piano or hitting a baseball, um, learn your basics, you know, really study and learn the basics. Um, and that is about acting and timing and, and the technique and technology of animation. Animation is um, nearly all digital now, so learn your software. Uh, and whether you go into uh, storytelling in movies or, or gaming or whatever, um, those skills are really, really valued right now. Uh, and there's plenty of schools that teach it, either online or, or you can migrate to one of the great schools out there, uh, like Ringling in Florida or, uh, oh, Chapman University in Los Angeles, USC. Um, man, there's, there's 200 schools out there that teach great animation courses. Okay, and, and what, how about yourself? What are you working on next? Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm looking for a documentary idea. I have a couple of thoughts and I have some meetings next week just on with Disney plus to talk about those thoughts um and I'm working on a, a book for Disney about the, the origin story of Disneyland um oh, wow. and that's about the early 50s about um where that came from and the deal with ABC that Walt and Roy made to um send programming to ABC and how that turned into Disneyland and then the early sketches and pencil sketches for Disneyland and how that turned into the park. So I'm doing an origin story um, on that that I've been working on for a while. Oh, I look forward to that as well. <laughs> wow. and, and how can people follow you on social media? Well, that's a good question. I'm on, uh, <laughs> on, I'm on Facebook, I, I'm on Instagram, at Don Hahn, I think. Um, so I'm out there if you search me on, um, Instagram or Facebook. I, I'm not on Twitter because I just don't understand Twitter. <laughs> it seems like tedious and weird. Um, maybe Elon Musk will do something with it. Um, so I'm out there and I, I uh, you know, I, I try to respond to people, not, not in terms of stories and things because I can't respond to people that send me stories or scripts, but Sometimes people ask, as you did, like yes. advice for their son or daughter. And um, <laughs> I'm really happy to help out with that because that was me at one time. You know, I had to ask. And, and uh, some of the guys at Disney really helped me when I was a young and, and uh, it's a real pleasure to do the same. Mm. Well, Don, I thank, we thank you so much for joining us today. It was such an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you. Uh, we've been like, and I've been looking forward to this, <laughs> to, to getting to speak to you. Oh, thanks. Well, same here. Thanks for reaching out. I appreciate your, uh, you know, your, your questions and uh, what you guys do too. It's, it's uh, Disney's a hard thing to wrap your head around. And I think the more people that can um, talk about it and cover it and, um, you know, understand it, the better, because it's a really wonderful, special um concept you know yes yeah. there's disney the corporation yes there's disney the the parks and everything else but the the um philosophy of disney i think is really interesting as well
Hmm. Well, we were just talking, you know, you have so many credits, so I'm sure in the comments we're going to get about the things that we didn't cover. But in, uh, <laughs> when, you, when you decide to do the next venture, you're, wel you're welcome back. We'd love to have you. If you want to talk about that as well, we'd love to have you on. Thank you. That's really nice. Well, I really appreciate it. Love talking to you guys. Well, again, uh, this has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen with Ike Eisenman. And again, a very special thanks to Don Hahn. And please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. 